Hello, Pop and Play listeners. This is Nathan here. We are hard at work on season five, which focuses on children's media. We're having a bunch of excellent conversations with media creators and with kids, and we can't wait to bring those to you in the spring. In the meantime, we've been releasing a new kind of content, pop-offs. Hopefully you've had a chance to listen to a few of these short episodes that allow us to talk about media as it's happening, current events, and really, well, you know, whatever we feel like we need to pop-off about. We've already released three of these pop-offs, and there are many more to come, so stay tuned. And since we've been at this now for four seasons, and that's over 30 episodes, we thought it might be helpful to new and old listeners alike to revisit some of our past favorites. So for this week, we're going all the way back to season one with Future Dreaming. In this episode, Haney talks about speculative fiction and creative reimagining with Ebony Elizabeth Thomas, Olu Anamashan, and Lalitha Vasudevan. Sadly, I wasn't able to co-host this episode with Haney, but it's still one of my absolute favorites. And maybe that should tell me something? One more thing. If you're liking Pop and Play, please share it. Share it with your friends, share it with your family, students, and really, you know, whoever you think might like it. And if you really, really like it, please leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify. Thanks. Enjoy. This week on Pop and Play, we talked with Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas and Olu Animashan about the intersection of race, pop culture, and social imagination through writing and media. Ebony is a professor of literacy, culture, and international education at the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education. She is, among many other things, author of The Dark Fantastic, Race and the Imagination from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games. Olu is a doctoral student in the Department of Curriculum and Teaching at Teachers College. Her work is about the possibilities of play, fantasy, and literacy in the narrative and stories of Black girls. Notably, she is a middle school teacher, and therefore, by default, the coolest of us all. We loved talking with them about their work in speculative fiction as a way of imagining new futures, ultimately with the goal of remaking the world in its unjust conditions. We couldn't think of a better duo who made us wonder, ask new questions, and develop our own curiosities. And isn't this what this whole season was about? The potential of play to awaken our curiosities, to imagine different kinds of possibilities and worlds, and to provoke in us new questions and thoughts. As you'll hear, Nathan was unable to join us this episode. He was actually playing with his kids during their spring break. And of course, we always excuse, condone, and support this at all times. But don't worry, we got our episode one host, Lalitha Vasudevan, back instead. everybody. This is Haney. Um, Unfortunately, Nathan is not here today, but in his own words, he says we get a co-host upgrade um, in Lolita. Hi, Haney. I am saying hi, and I don't know about that assessment, but I'll try to live up to it. I'm sure you will. (laughs) Um, And then we have Olu Animashan, and she is a doctoral student. Do you want to say hi? Hello. Um, And then Ebony Elizabeth Thomas. Hello. And those two will be our guests today as we talk about speculative fiction, play, and creative reimagining. Um, so um, I thought I would start off this way because I think when I think of all three of you, I think of you all as disruptors and people who kind of think outside of the box and help me to reimagine academic space, to reimagine my own work. Um, And one of our last podcast episodes that we had with John Jackson, Dean of Annenberg School at UPenn, we talked about multimodal scholarship. And one of the things that he said that really stuck with me is that it's not that multimodal scholarship is the future of academia, because it's already here, right? And it's a matter of whether or not we want to participate, contribute, get on board. Um, And I really liked that framing of it. Um, And so I was hoping that you could just say a little bit about your work and what you are working on now, and perhaps what you're excited about as you look into the next couple of years. I am sort of an accidental expert in multimodality because I set out to first write children's and young adult books that had a speculative bent. And then um, when those doors were barred in publishing, because at the time um, you were writing Black children's books or you were writing speculative fiction. And when I started graduate school, I um, spent five years um, working in linguistics and discourse analysis. 
And then finally, when I got my job at Penn, I was able to propose The Dark Fantastic as a project that could be part of my tenure and promotion to associate professor package so to speak. So um, along the way, most of what I have done has not really been academic work. So um, I am a known quantity in children's publishing and increasingly in science fiction and fantasy um, publishing and in those worlds. Um, But really, my home base is children's literature, both um, the um, publishing industry and um, critics and scholars. Um, I've had to build that connection organically because there were very few places in the academy to train in those fields and certainly not at research institutions, um, most research institutions. And so it has been quite a journey over the past um, two decades to build and to form a career where I'm thinking about not just children's books, but about media, about youth and young adulthood and fan cultures And, um, you know, just thinking about how stories for uh, children of color, especially Black children, exist and following the track of those stories um, wherever they show up across modes. So in, you know, books and, um, you know, comics, fan cultures, television shows, um, films, et cetera, et cetera. So it has really been an accidental um journey. And I, I'm really thankful for the serendipity of it all because I, I really did stumble into a lot of my work um, through wanting to do other things. I mean, like that accidental journey is so motivating for especially up and coming and new scholars, right? To see a model or example of someone who is highly regarded for their intellect and scholarship and, and you know, regarded highly because of all the ways that you've been able to merge some of the things that are your passions that have been lifelong. Right? So I think that's such a good model and example for us. Um, Olu. Ooh, I mean, like, I have goosebumps now. I'm, like, fangirling <laughs> so hard being in the company <laughs> of all of you right now. I'm just so overwhelmed. Um, and exactly what, Haney, what you just said is just so spot on. I think I've been incredibly uh, blessed to be an emerging scholar in this particular moment where speculative fiction feels like something that is possible to talk about in the academy and not feel like such an outsider and outcast. I think we still have a way to go in many places, but I am so excited that I have people that I can look up to and say that like, yeah, no, they've done this work and here's how I can continue to like build and reimagine for myself what this can look like for me. Getting to thinking about speculative fiction started off with my mother, actually. So my um, parents are Nigerian immigrants. And so one of the things that my mom did wasn't reading books. It was orating stories when we were going to bed. And so it would be like stories about the gods. It would be stories about dog and turtle. And so for many years, that was my real flesh and blood connection to Nigeria. I wouldn't be able to visit for many, many years. Um, And so it was like in those stories that I was rooted to the possibility of Nigeria, to my connection to Nigeria outside of like my parents' um, histories and of course my bloodline. Um, But of course I moved, (laughs) went to college and that that connection fades. Um, And so for me, the question then became like, what does it mean to be Nigerian if I don't have these stories as present as I used to? What does it mean when... um, my parents aren't close anymore. My like faith-based communities, which were also my like Nigerian-based communities too, aren't present. And it be- the answer became speculative fiction again. When I think about the possibility of speculative fiction, I think about the ability for it to like connect these like indigenous histories and like also like make them feel lived and present and in the future. And so that's what I'm really excited to see and like moving forward. Hmm. I feel like if our colleague Nathan was here, he would have really resonated only with what you just said. Um, especially about Afrofuturism as as, uh, a way of thinking about design and sort of designing futures and sort of allowing the conditions that support the catalyzation of that design. Mm -hmm. Um, So just to to kind of embody a little bit of Nathan's uh, (laughs) spirit and ethos here, I think he would have really appreciated that. Um, So in Pop and Play, what we usually try to do is we usually try to start by playing some kind of game. So the game that we're going to play with you all um, is a sort of a merging of speculative fiction and the game that everybody probably knows, which is Would You Rather. Okay, so I'm going to give you some scenarios of Would You Rather, and you have to answer which one you would pick. We're going to start with the first question, which is, 
Would you rather be trapped in Narnia or Hogwarts forever? I would want to be trapped in Narnia um, easily. I mean, just Hogwarts in the wizarding world. And I've written fan fiction there. I spent a lot of imaginative time there before recent years and events. Um, Narnia, I mean, I could be a queen forever somewhere in Narnia, you know, after the last battle. And I don't trust Hogwarts like that, especially because Hogwarts is more... um, tied to our human world, our imperfect world. And I'm thinking about mm. Hogwarts in the 2020s. I mean, we don't have as much information about that. So, yeah, definitely <laughs> Narnia. <laughs> oh, you just, you just added, like, a really interesting temporal dimension to this. Because Hogwarts in 2020, 2021 feels complicated. Hogwarts in, like, maybe 1952? Also complicated, but for different reasons. Mm. <laughs> so, like, who... I don't know how to answer that question. Because yeah. then I... Because now you're making me think... What, like, not just would... Where would I rather be trapped, but... It depends on who I am. Mm. Right? Like, could I be a Patronus in Hogwarts? Sure. Keep me there. <laughs> Bring me when you need me. Right. right? Like, I'll be reading in the corner otherwise, but if you need me, here I am. But a muggle or like a, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You're messing with my brain a little bit, Ebony. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be a muggle or a witch in Hogwarts like right now. You know, I I was like definitively Hogwarts, and now me I am like oh uh, maybe I chose wrong. I chose wrong. <laughs> there are no right or wrong answers. I feel like no, I chose wrong. <laughs> I would do Narnia with like Queen Ebony, absolutely. I also kind of want to be the Whomping Willow. You know, I would be the Whomping Willow in Hogwarts. That's, that's, that's what I would do if I if that was my choice. <laughs> that's a really good one. Oh my gosh. Oh my god, okay, so the answers are making this go really well. So the next question, I'm going to shift a little bit. Um, So would you rather have the Force, but have to be roommates with C-3PO for the rest of your life, or be able to time travel, but only backward? Hmm. Lots of contemplation here. Yeah. Annoying roommates are not popular, I guess. <laughs> no, I would I would travel backwards. I would time travel backwards. But I also think it's because like place is unlimited, right? So I could like time travel backwards to like Jupiter in like mm-hmm. ten thousand BCE, right? And then, you know, just different places to go. It doesn't just have to be bound to this earth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, what Olu said. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to go the unconventional route and be roommates with C-3PO and I am going to keep up with the force. Don't stop. Don't stop till you get enough. I'm going to go with the force because the force is awesome and I can annoy C-3PO. I have, I am the annoying roommate. Like, I have that personality. I grew up sharing a room with both my little sisters because we grew up in a two-bedroom house, and that's why we're annoyingly close today. So I think I can hold my own with a droid. That's a good strategy. Out, annoy the annoying. Okay. Would you rather be invited into the house of vampires or zombies? Oh, easy. Easy. <laughs> Vampires. I don't do zombies. <laughs> I don't do zombies. I know. I don't do. Vampires are sexy. Zombies are creepy. I would do zombies because I think there might be like uh, the key to immortality there. Maybe, oh you know, like a biological something that we can find there. I guess the same could be said for vampires too. But I, I just like I don't know the the peril and the de- desire thing together. I just don't want to be in danger while I'm like falling in love. That feels like a lot. If Bella has taught me anything for Twilight, like it's just too much. I don't want it. So I, <laughs> I'm just gonna do that. Oh my god, wow. I'm dying. 
I mean, thank you so much for answering all these questions and playing this game. That was really, really fun. I actually found out a lot about the three of you just by asking these questions. <laughs> Having both of you here, we should definitely spend time talking about Afrofuturism and speculative fiction. You know, Ebony, you talk a lot about, about this in your own work, about myth-making and the imaginative and restoring and retelling um, through fiction, through art, through creative works, and how we can reimagine, especially systems for communities of color, right, where their stories are not there. One of the things that we've said throughout our podcast is that play doesn't always have to be exactly what we imagine to be as like a lot of kids just jumping up and down and having the time of their lives and giggling, right? That play can also be really intellectual and serious work. And the thing about play is that it comes with a range of affective emotions, right? And some of it can be truly joyful, right? Where some of it can be truly disturbing. And then a lot of times it's actually both of those things at the same time, right? So um, so if you could talk about the role of speculative fiction, particularly Afrofuturism, and the work of play as it intersects with how you reimagine. So play and Afrofuturism. So first of all, um, I titled the book and by theory, The Dark Fantastic, because I wanted to uh, separate out my consideration of racism in Western speculative fiction from what I saw as the Afrofuturistic movement in the arts, you know, across genre and mode and Afrofuturism as an aesthetic. And then recently I've been listening to and thinking through um, African, um, you know, af people working on the continent in speculative fiction and first and second generation African immigrants who are also Black American, mm -hmm. but who have direct lineage to the continent, critiquing Black Atlantic remembrances of Africa, because my ancestry is at least seven to 10 or more generations back, and it was amalgamated. So when I spit in a cup, um, the whole of West and Central Africa lit up, which is not helpful. Mm. So it is a kind of lineage that you can't disentangle. And that has been remembered and misremembered and partially remembered, um, you know, for centuries. Like, so it's not something new where people who were part of the transatlantic slave trade longed for or tried to remember or conjure up the African continent, wherever their ancestors came from. But because of the brutality of the slave trade, because of the fact that people weren't allowed to select partners or spouses from the same, you know, traditions. We ended up being amount, you know, like just, and so we have the phenomenon of Wakandification, Zumundification. I'm starting to see a rift between those who are advocating for African futurism, including Nettie Okorafor, mm -hmm. and people who are, you know, not liking that because they feel as if it is a rejection on the part of African creatives. So I always feel like politics complicates our play. So um, I would like to play, you know, one of my favorite characters is an African who was played by an African-American, um, Lieutenant Uhura of Star Trek. So she was played by Nichelle Nichols, who's mm -hmm. Black American like I am. But, you know, one of the things that Trek has never done, and um, I could go on and on about Trek. I will not make this a Trek cat, uh, <laughs> podcast because I was out about the Harry Potter fandom because I couldn't tell people how much I love Star Trek. Because, you know, if you were a Trekkie <laughs> as a Generation Xer, that was just a kiss of death. You wouldn't have any friends. Nobody would date you. It was just, oh, seriously, my generation. See, look, Lalita's nodding. You, you, like, you, you just didn't do it. So anyway, what I want you to say is that now that we have, um, I believe, Nigerian-American producers and writers on the new shows, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that finally with Strange New Worlds, we can get more of Uhura's Kenyan background like where you know who are her people within Kenya is she Luo like Obama is she you know like what customs would she have in the 23rd century so I'm really keenly interested in thinking about how politics how nationality and how 
deep remembrances, which is, I think, a theme we're starting to draw out here, um, you know, remembrance near and far, how that influences our play these days. So that's where I am right now. I mean, I can talk about Dark Fantastic, but where my work is now is thinking about Afrofuturism versus African futurism. And maybe it's not a versus, maybe it's an and, maybe it's a both and we want it all. Mm-hmm. I, can I, I, I have a question and, and it's sort of, it was something I was going to ask later, but it ties into what you were just saying now. And I really love and wrestle with this idea that you put out there, which I think is exactly right. Like it, politics complicates our play, mm-hmm. right? And and I'm thinking also of sort of how the market, like what's the cause and effect of the market and audience interest and um, sort of what people have an appetite for and what shapes that, but also how does that shape what it's possible? And so really exciting to think about who is at the helm of these shows that have an iconic legacy and also how they got there and where it leads to. So I I, I, I wondered if you wanted to, if either of you, because I know both of you are thinking about this. Um, can you say a little bit about sort of how you think about that tension of market audience and the media creation itself or the, the pop culture kinds of artifacts that are out there? That's such a great question, Lolita. Something I've been thinking about uh, recently is um, language practices in particular books. Um, and so one of the things that I, I think made me feel at home with Nettie Okorafor was just how much, how many African languages are present in her book. Um, like I see Yoruba, I see Igbo, I see in, like scripts that haven't existed in so long are like in her book. And the same with, um, I'm currently reading a book called Rosewater, the Rosewater series, which is amazing and I highly recommend. But that too also has just like lots of Yoruba in it and it always makes me feel like home. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is um, like just in the pop culture artifacts, like how we sound in different places. What does it look like to show up as an African? I, One of my parents' favorite movies, oddly enough, is Coming to America. Um, I know, they love it. And I was like, I feel like that's like the one film that I've actually seen like black Americans and like African Americans like not be mad at <laughs> together. I mean, like I feel like it's like a very odd like this does not work well for either of us, but yes, yeah, somehow <laughs> we've made it work and like laugh at it together. <laughs> um but even with like the ways that Africans show up in that text, in that film, it it doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> like not all of us are princess, not all of us have this immense wealth. Not all of us have all ac- this kind of access. Um but yeah, I, I think in terms of thinking about what, how we show up, <laughs> I, so much of it feels oddly speculative in the in a different direction, in a not true direction, <laughs> mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. rooted in any authenticity. I don't even think that answers yeah. your question, but you're starting to somewhere. <laughs> I just think that, you know, this does tie into the theme of your podcast play, because I'm thinking about this idea like um, Jade Bentil, who's black British, I believe that I can't remember where her parents are from, but she grew up in the UK. She coined the term Wakandification. So one of the things that happened um, when Black Panther was released um, is that um, black Americans and other black folks who, again, don't have direct Um, You know, and I shouldn't, you know, I'm using that word for the lack of a better term, because certainly our ancestors, you know, came over long ago, but we don't have specific ties to um, current um, nations, ethnic groups, etc. We're wearing African garb to the um, opening of Black Mm. Panther, and it was pretty contested. And so I do think that there's, I am trying to be tender and soft and listen to the fact that when we did that and other, you know, there were folks who were in school with us who were made fun of for the clothes, who were, you know, the foods, you know, and yeah, so I I, I get that it is super complicated. I, th- I just definitely think we need to listen. Like when people say my culture is not cosplay, I think that that is something that is super complicated and we really do need to work through it and listen to folks who are saying, you know, listen, this needs to be done more thoughtfully. But one of the things I just really wanted to think through is the way that rich 
white cishet male producers, which is no one on this call because it's like Hollywood, Disney, mm-hmm. and um, some very highly connected mm-hmm. black U.S. capitalists artists Mm -hmm. are really driving some of the the divide so like you know the the decisions made um for wakanda in black panther wakanda Mm -hmm. does not come out of the black american imagination it comes out of the imagination of marvel Mm -hmm. black is king Mm -hmm. is rooted in the lion king which even at the time some of us were like okay we finally have a disney movie set in africa but it is like where in africa that's a continent even bigger than north america and two how how come there are no humans when you mm-hmm. finally have a movie? So um, Black is King was rooted in, um, you know, Disney. So I'm thinking about the motives of Disney, Marvel, Warner Brothers, and sort of the ways in which white supremacy has shaped or intervened in these sort of twisted remembrances. Um, and so I've just been trying to think about how complicated the question is. I do want to extend tenderness to my own folks and, you know, for this longing for somewhere that isn't the U.S., longing for something that isn't, you know, a white dominated society where we've been on the edge. But I do think as we strive to go back and deal with the problem of return, which, listen, some of my friends said isn't a problem, you know. But Michelle M. Wright talks about this problem of going back through the door of no return and trying to remember what was there before. I do think it's important for us to research, for us to talk to living, breathing, actual folks who are on the continent and who have direct ties in order to do ethical um, uh, Afrofuturist or African futurist work. And that's, I know I'm kind of the cheese that stands alone in the middle of these debates. So. Mm-hmm. No, that's such an interesting question, though, because I, I definitely went with friends who did dress up in African garb. And I was like, where'd you get that? Because <laughs> my mom tailored this one for me. Like, wait, wait, you caught that. But um, something that I've been, like, forced to think about on the other end is how tender I can be when people are, like, trying to build something up, build up this, like, African identity. But I also think it's just really interesting to think about you know, colonization too, and what it looks like for Africans to try to remember themselves. Um, And I think that's just something that I've been having a lot of conversation with my parents about because they, they'll be okay. I was like, they were born (laughs) on the cusp of um, decolonization. And so they've seen both worlds, right? Um, And so for them, it's been, it's also a process of unlearning for them too, or relearning. And I think that also needs to be acknowledged somewhere in the conversation as well. And I feel like that often gets buried. The, the thing that we're trying to remember has also been lost on the continent too, to some degree. And we'll all try to figure out how we go forward. Oh, I got goosebumps. Um, I think another thing is that I just think about how complex um, the work is. Because um, when we think about speculative fiction, I would say that Right now, it is having a moment, right? Like where it's popularized in the larger landscape, people are really getting on it, and everybody's realizing in the midst of, um, you know, racial reckoning that we have to put, we have to make this visible, right? And I think part of that is missing the conversation that you both are bringing in, right? That it's also so tied to identity, it's so tied to land, it's so tied to your linguistic practices, right? Your creativity, imagination, and how much of that conversation is not happening when we appreciate, right, black art or appreciate speculative fiction or appreciate Mm -hmm. the kinds of writing that you're talking about here. And it's 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 helping, I think, to necessarily decenter who's the audience for these moments and movements. I, I was thinking about uh, I, I think I either heard or saw a talk that you gave, Ebony, and where you were trying to kind of distinguish between are we in a moment, are we in a movement? Um, and that just really stayed with me. If the audience is always singular or it doesn't reflect the people about whom this work is happening and it doesn't engage them in the production you know, just to use your uh, framing, does the moment have the possibility of becoming a movement? Does the movement have the possibility of engaging in lasting change? Y'all, that's just quoting Ebony. I think each of you is positioned in places and institutions that are trying to pull levers of change in different kinds of way. As you've been thinking about the kinds of, you know, um, work either that you've been producing yourself or that you've been engaging with, do you, where do you see some of those levers of, of kind of 
shifting um, movements, moments to movements, movements to change. Well, for me, um, one of the things that I have delighted in is over the past five to seven years, um, Black science fiction, fantasy, um, horror, and comics going from the margins, going from the realm of independent creators who just couldn't break through to the center of the culture. I do think that the success of Black Panther within the larger narrative arc of the Marvel Cinematic Universe was a watershed moment. So in in anticipation of that, we had um, lots of work greenlit. So, but I also want to acknowledge that Black Panther didn't birth Black speculation Mm -hmm. anywhere on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. So we have always dreamed of the Afro future. We have Mm -hmm. always dreamed of the Afro future. And so, but in the past five to seven years, when the Dark Fantastic came out, it was the year after Black Panther. And people thought, like we always think, especially here in the United States, because of the American dream myth, that there there was no need for my book. So I was never really worried about it. So I don't even deal with Black Panther in The Dark Fantastic because the period of writing it was between 2012 and 2016. And if there's one thing I know about um, race in the United States is that it is a many splendor thing that has existed since before the inception of the country for which my folks were, you know, like we were here for the founding, right? And so I know it was going to take another few centuries for us to sort it out. Not because I want it to be that way. Goodness knows I'm ready for Starfleet. I always like, like <laughs> dreaming of Starfleet. Like when can I get to Jupiter station and then, you know, Vulcan and Andoria. Okay. So anyway, yeah, like that's where my brain is if I'm not professoring, mm-hmm. but <laughs> since we know that's not the case, like that's not our future trajectory looking at where we are, then I think the, the the challenge here is to think about how we then can sort through the detrius of the present and what we have all inherited, you know, each one of us, and how we can sort through it so that then we can spin out a better trajectory for those who are coming after us. Because certainly, you know, when young people wear the... Um, t-shirts, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams, people think they're being obnoxious, but no, not really. They're actually signaling towards something super important Mm -hmm. that someone in the past had to conceive of our present. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we've been doing is, I hope, you know, pushing toward a world where we are dreaming toward the future. Um, You know, I always say in our work in children's literature criticism, people kind of poo-poo what I do sometimes because they're like, oh, she thinks about children's books. But I, you know, what we choose right now, as far as children's books and media is concerned, will have effect in the mid-22nd century. We Mm -hmm. are still talking about Alice in Wonderland, Mm -hmm. published in the 1860s, Little Women, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Also published in, you know, during that period. Mm-hmm. Um, Anne of Green Gables is one of my favorite stories. That's 120 years old mm-hmm. and counting. So what we do now, the seeds we plant now and the ways in which we have kids play, which mm-hmm. is the theme of your podcast, you know, we I mean, it's just this is future dreaming. It's not something that's pie in the sky. We every, day by day, we are creating the landscapes mm-hmm. of the future. Mm-hmm. That's, That's a really like such an image. important point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> as you say, as you say that too, it just sounds so obvious after you said it. Like, yeah, this is kind of creating the landscape for the future. Um, but it's another thing to have someone actually point it out and think about that in terms of how we even arrived at the present canon, right? And how we arrived here. Yeah. It's so hard to get rid of those canons once they mm-hmm. form and once we, which is what I'm arguing about Harry Potter, like we are deciding whether or not, I mean, the ship has kind of sailed because it was so pervasive with millennials, but we really are choosing whether or not people have to deal with, you know, whatever problems are with it in 2100, because the kids of today are still going to be, they're going to be the grandparents of 2100. I love the, I love the invitation to consider these moments as seeds of 
you know, 200 years from now, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which is, yeah, which I think helps us get out of ourselves a little bit and, and maybe even advances the, the, necessi- the necessity of, of playing in this way, right? That it isn't trivial or extra, but it's essential and necessary. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was thinking about how syllabi has changed over the last couple of years for um, the academy, for just being a grad student, just like the change I've seen between like my first year and my present year, like who gets to be a part of the classroom. Like now I see, I I literally was assigned your book not only a couple of weeks ago. Um, <laughs> it was great because I already read it. So I was like, yes, I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> but then also seeing like Sadia Hartman, seeing Sharp, right? I think those seeing those scholars come to the forefront, seeing those scholars come to the center, allow a place for like future dreaming that I don't think was present before. Um, And I I think I'm excited for that kind of edge of speculation to be present in the academy. I'm excited for that to be something that gets to be honored. I'm really excited for the ways that that could change paradigms in the ways that we approach our research, (laughs) in the ways that we not only approach our participants, but the ways that we just think about our theories and our ways and our ontologies of our students and our participants. Um, and so I, I think I'm thinking a lot about that. Like, what does it mean for me as like a current grad student to be able to speculate the ways that I do my research, the ways that I can move forward? So as you know, we got through one question, which is amazing. <laughs> it's like a world record. <laughs> um, but it was a great conversation. And um the, you know, the title of this podcast is called Pop and Play. And at the end, so we start with an act of play. And at the end, we end with what's poppin'. And I'm sure all the Gen Zers and everybody are like, you guys are such nerds. It's like the Trekkie <laughs> thing, right? Where people are like, what are you saying? What does that even mean, right? <laughs> um, so what we're trying to do without dating ourselves is to end with something happening in the pop culture landscape that you're currently engaging with, that you're excited about. It could be something that you're watching, something that you're listening to, reading. It could be a meme that you saw. Um, it could be any of those things. So what's popping for you in the pop culture landscape? Lolita. <laughs> oh, man. Why always make me go first? Well, I have an answer ready. So there you go. Um, Last year, I read an awesome graphic novel called New Kid, which I absolutely Mm -hmm. loved and just devoured. Um, And I've read it like several times in a row. And I just got Class Act, which is the follow up by Jerry Craft to New Kid. Um, And I've just started it and I had to slow myself down because I could have just read it all at once. Um, It's an um, it's I just love the way he tells stories. I love the intentional way he weaves in so much um, so much in like a single cell of this graphic novel. Um, so it's making me really happy. And that is what's popping for me. Class act. Mm, Jerry Craft. Thank you. How about you, Ebony? Well, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there are, I will restrict it to just three things. So over on my Eb watches Trek Twitter, I have been celebrating the Star Trek universe just because You know, everybody keeps counting out my favorite science fiction televised series. But, you know, we had a wonderful revival last year. Star Trek gave us, at the height of the pandemic, 33 new episodes across three different series. It They have an incredible creative team. They have um, Black, Indigenous, people of color. We got um, LGBTQ representation. Um, you know, I have my critiques, but they are just incredible. So I created a hashtag to celebrate Trek Black History Month. It's Trek BHM. And so um, we are just celebrating. And yesterday, um, Trondi Newman, who plays Ensign Beckett Mariner on the animated series Lower Decks, gave me a shout out. So (laughs) can't tell me anything today. So that's number one. (laughs) Number two is that Rick Riordan Presents from Disney Publishing is finally going to, after the success of um, Sal and Gabby Brick the Universe, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky, shout out to Kwame and Balia, and all that series for middle grades readers, they are officially starting a YA 
imprint. And they just announced the author of the Shadow Shaper trilogy, Daniel Jose Older, is going to be writing a series there. I know, oh my, I know. And so they're going to be um, highlighting. And then, I mean, this is the era and the age of Black girl fantasy and science fiction from the major publishers. After knocking on their doors for mm-hmm. decades and decades, we're getting some amazing people. And so shout out to Tracy Dion, who was the very first fantasy author to ever win a Coretta Scott King Award for the Best mm-hmm. New Talent, the Steptoe Award. Legendborn mm-hmm. is a retelling of mm-hmm. Arthurian legend that puts a Black girl from North Carolina in the center. And Tracy mm-hmm. is a brilliant storyteller. Um, I just, I love and support all my millennial and Generation Z author friends. They are doing the darn thing, okay? Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> that is what I am loving. It it is like I had to wait until I was in my 40s to get to this era. Mm, but truly, right. this is an Afrofuturistic, African futuristic renaissance, and I am loving it. Well, everybody yes. now knows who to call yes. if they need a hype person. Hello. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Listen, listen, I'm still trying to get on a set, a Star Trek set. Before I die, I am going to be, I want to walk on Ensign Roll. That is like the ultimate Trekkie right. Trekker thing. Like, I want to walk on. All right, any producers listening? That's Ebony <laughs> Elizabeth Thomas. She's at UPenn. She would like a walk on roll. I think uh-huh. we're going to make it happen, Ebony. We're yeah. going to work on it for Ed you. Watches, Ed watches Trek Twitter, which I can yep. tell yes. Olu had just subscribed to. I did. I did. I did. <laughs> I can tell tell by watching her. I'm like, I know what she's doing right now. (laughs) Nice. I feel like we just got some breaking information here. This is awesome. We're going to have to release this first. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, how about you? Um... WandaVision. WandaVision is what's trending for me right now. That's what's popping. It's that and also, like... Marvel TikTok. That's just the whole I've been in right now with the amount of analysis. Like, they're teaching me how to be a better researcher because, whoa, the deep dives, the connections, the just the media ecology that they're working in. It's amazing. So that's 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 where I'm living right now. That's what's happening. I I gotta get on that. One thing I'm excited to do is on Monday, I bought bought, like virtual screening tickets to Mirari, which is the Steven Yeun you know, the movie, or Minari as the Americans say. <laughs> um, but um, but I'm really excited about that. And I think it just yeah. struck me that I just haven't read a, like or seen a story about me, right? And mm-hmm. I think because I've been a big fan of Steven Yeun, like I watched The Walking Dead and I love The Walking Dead still. And I know nobody's watching that still, but I am. <laughs> but yeah, I think the idea of like a Korean immigrant family and and living in a rural area, I think that is such a new kind of story and perspective for me that isn't the same as mine, but I'm excited to see what the connections of that is. And I think it gets us towards what we've all talked about with narrative plenitude, right? Just mm-hmm. seeing more stories of ourselves out there that are different kinds of stories. So I'm very, very excited about that. I was just going to say, listen, as a fan of a 55-year-old series with uh, um, 801 episodes and as <laughs> someone who was is friends with Supernatural fans and Supernatural oh. ran 20 years, you are you. fine loving The Walking Dead. <laughs> May it have many more seasons, okay? <laughs> Like, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I hope they're actually hearing this. AMC, take notes. Come on, AMC. Is that the note we want them to take? Is that really? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's the best decision for them to like. No. Mm. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Well, this has been super fun. And I could actually be in this conversation forever. It's been so great um, to be in company with each of you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Lolita, for being an excellent co-host. Thank you, Olu and Ebony. Um, Thank you for your insights. Thank you for your time. Um, Thank you for all the resources and the things that you've suggested to us about what's popping. We'll be sure to check that out. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. This was so fun. Yeah, this was so fun. Thanks to Ebony and Olu for joining us, and to Lolita for co-hosting. And as always, thanks to you for listening. 
This episode was edited by Lucius Von Joe and Joe Rena Ferry. Hop and Play is produced by Haney Yoon, Lalitha Vasudevan, Joe Rena Ferry, and myself, Nathan Holbert, at Teachers College, Columbia University with the Digital Futures Institute. For a transcript and to learn more, visit tc.edu slash poppinplay. Our music is selections from Leaf Eaters by Pottington Bear, used here under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial license. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. 